Hello, and it's time for Wednesday Warfare, where I review NXT and AEW Dynamite back-to-back -back and try and figure out which show won for the week. As always, like what you like, don't be a dick. Let's begin. NXT begins with a recap of what happened last week when Karrion Cross destroyed Dominic Dijakovic, but the best part of that was the song they used, The end is here! The game is over! I love the old Armageddon theme. I pop big for the, that, that use of the song there. Nice for them to break that one out after a long time. The first match is women's tag team match as Io Shirai and Tegan Knox take on Dakota Kai and Candice LeRae. Uh, Dakota jumps Io on the ramp as she's making her entrance. Then things finally settle down and the match begins proper. It's a really fast-paced, entertaining opener. All four ladies on showcase here on display in this matchup. It ends when EO is flying all over the place and finally hits a moonsault on Candice to win for her team. And the story we see at the end of that is Dakota kind of abandoning her partner afterward. Then later on in the night, we see a promo from Dakota where she basically declares herself the number one contender for EO's championship. Rhea Ripley and her uh, freshly bleached blonde hair walks in and basically has a problem with that. So we find out that next week there'll be a number one contender match between the two of them should be a good one. We get a recap of what happened between Adam Cole and Pat McAfee this past week on Pat's radio show where apparently Adam got upset with a line of questioning and got in Pat's face and started yelling and screaming at him and cursing and all that stuff. I cannot believe there was actually debate online as to whether or not it was a shoot. It looked like the workiest work that ever worked when I watched it, but it turns out, you know, and we're not done with it yet. If it were a shoot, I think they would have probably tried to downplay what happened here, but they're clearly hyping up some sort of future interaction with Pat and Adam, some kind of return thing happening there. Things aren't over with them yet. Honestly, this doesn't move the needle for me. As a fan, I don't really care about, you know, sports radio. Don't want, don't listen to Pat's show. I've heard a little bit of his stuff when he was doing some commentary and analysis for like the NXT pre-shows and whatnot and the pay-per-view pre-shows. But uh, this little feud or whatever this is with Pat and Adam Cole doesn't really do much for me. I think this is kind of a disappointing first first angle post historic championship reign for Adam Cole. Up next, Roderick Strong taking on Johnny Gargano. Some fallout from last week's triple threat match they were involved in and uh, William Regal made this match after some petty and stupid name calling between the two of them on Twitter. I've seen worse setups. Anyway, despite the lame setup for this, it was actually a really good match. Uh, lots of good graps, very physical stuff. Probably like the best heel versus heel matchup I've seen in a long time. Most I even brought this up on a recent live stream. I hate the idea of heel versus heel matches for the most time, most part, because that's really hard for fans to get behind either one of them, and so ultimately, kind of, no one really cares. But this was done fairly well, and a lot has to do with the fact that this is like a very canned audience that kind of knows how to react. But they were just kind of loving everything here. I think it was a really well fought match. Uh, Johnny wins with one final beat, and uh, yeah, I think it was a good, you know, good win for Gargano. He hasn't had too many of them, despite his big heel turn a few months ago in Portland. T Thatch is interviewed backstage talking about his involvement in the triple threat later tonight with uh, Dexter Loomis and Finn Balor. As he's talking about his opponents, you see Loomis being all creepy and sneaky in the background. And then elsewhere, we see Kyle O'Reilly trying to pump up his undisputed buddies because they're all down to the dumps and everything after what happened to Roderick Strong. Then we go to our next match as Shotzi Blackheart takes on Mercedes Martinez. Uh, last week, Martinez showed up on TV to jump Shotzi after her match and has joined up with the Robert Stone brand, an unlikely pairing if ever there was one. Martinez is looking very vicious in this match. Pretty short and sweet. Shotzi gets a couple of shots in, but ultimately uh, she falls when Martinez drops her on the back of her neck uh, to win the matchup here. Robert Stone is happy, no longer disheveled. Uh, again, I'm really enjoying Mercedes being on NXT. And like I said last week, NXT needs more just badass female heels with Shayna Baszler gone. So let's see what Mercedes can do. We get a vignette for the pending arrival of Ridge Holland, a former rugby player turned NXT UK star. He's advertised to be in the triple threat match, the ladder match qualifier for next week. Uh, I'm not familiar with his work. Haven't seen him on NXT UK, but the hype package was convincing. So I'm curious to see what he brings to the table. Then the champion Keith Lee makes his way to the ring to address what happened last week. The aforementioned beat down of Dijakovic by Karrion Cross. Keith Lee swears twice, and as he calls out Karrion Cross, Cameron Grimes makes his way out instead, talks a lot of trash. He ends up getting beat up for his troubles by Lee. The lights go out and Scarlet appears on the stage. Grimes tries to attack Lee once again, but Lee hits him with a spirit bomb and he just kind of wipes him out of existence for a minute. Karrion Cross shows up on the big screen and blames Keith for what happened to Dominic last week and basically says, you know, either give me a title shot or more people will be hurt. Keith says, 
and name the time and the place and I'll beat your ass. And that's where it ends. And so you're assuming it's going to be TakeOver. Then William Regal pops in later in the show saying, you know, I, you just can't just make title matches willy-nilly. You got to earn them. So... I'm guessing Karrion Cross is going to earn that shot in the near future for TakeOver, right? That being said, I'm really excited about the prospect of Karrion Cross and Keith Lee for the title very soon. I like last week how they used Dijakovic as kind of like a sacrificial lamb to build more sympathy for Keith and everything, and just to really put over Cross as this big killer. And with these two guys, I mean, God, the, the smacks and the impact and the power moves, I cannot wait for that match when it inevitably happens. Eichner and Bartel, the tag team champs. Remember those guys? They take on Ever Rise in a non-title match here, and it's a pretty quick squash match. Imperium win after the European bomb. They're about to say something on the mic, but then the Undisputed Era show up, and all four members run in and beat up uh, the tag team champs and uh, chase them off. Seems kind of unfair. Kind of rekindling the spat the Undisputed Era and Imperium had at the last NXT UK TakeOver special several months ago. Uh, from what I saw this, it seems like it feels like a very kind of babyface thing, the way that Undisputed Era was received here. So is that where they're going? Is that going to be the kind of way they kind of restart the Undisputed Era after their big title losses in recent weeks? Uh, maybe that invalidates my thoughts about the Gargano uh, strong match earlier, it being heel versus heel. Maybe it was subtly heel versus face the whole time and I didn't even know it. But uh, maybe I'm kind of uh, extrapolating a bit too much. But uh, yeah, it seems to be maybe going to keep the Imperium UE feud going from here? I'm just kind of curious. Jake Atlas taking on Isaiah Swerve Scott. Not a lot of time given to this match, but they make the most of their time. My favorite move in this match is when Atlas hits Swerve with like a modified angle slam from the second rope after out of nowhere. It was really impressive. Ultimately, Scott wins after he avoids a rainbow DDT, hits the JML driver to win. So, uh, again, big win for Scott, and, you know, like I said, for as little time as they had, I think they've crammed a lot of action into it. Backstage, Damian Priest talks about his triple threat match next week with Oni Lorcan and Ridge Holland saying, on the last couple of weeks, this time the favorite is going to win. In our main event, we have the next ladder match qualifier. You've got Timothy Thatcher versus Dexter Loomis versus Finn Balor. Someone told me last week online that Timothy Thatcher's theme kind of sounds like Dan Severn's original theme from back in the day. If anyone deserves to inherit Dan Severn's theme, it's T-Thatch. Uh, early in the match, Loomis just casually as hell does a front flip from the ring to the outside, landing on his feet, immediately rendering Ricochet completely obsolete. It's a pretty good match here. Thatcher with some tasty leg locks on Balor over the apron. Uh, Loomis has Thatcher locked to the Anaconda device at one point, but then uh, Finn does a coup de grace to both guys to break it up. In the end, Loomis makes Thatcher pass out to his submission to win the match. So for two weeks in a row now, we've had some kind of dark horse, kind of upset victories in the triple threats. Last week was Bronson Reed when he was up against Gargano and Strong, and this week it was Loomis going against Thatcher and Balor. You know, not the first picks I think many people would have made for this. I like that they're going with these like non-established names these newer talents coming in and kind of giving them that showcase here. Will they continue and make it all relative unknowns? I doubt it. I think Damian Priest is going to win next week and might be the one to win the whole thing in the ladder match at TakeOver. But, I mean, the other people they're putting into the field, I like the choices they have right now. AEW opens up with a 10-man tag team match as the Inner Circle take on the Best Friends and Friends. That's Best Friends, Orange Cassidy, and the Jurassic Express. This match is kind of hard to get through. There's lots of sitting and standing and waiting around for people to get their spots in place and do their dives and everything. Although I did like this funny part at the end of the sequence when Marco Stunt gets on Luchasaurus' back and like rides him like a dinosaur and they just dive onto everybody. Uh, Luchasaurus' mask begins to malfunction. Part of the match, he has to kind of adjust that while everyone gets their stuff in. Orange stops Jericho from using the baseball bat and Matt Hardy also hits a sneak attack on Sammy Guevara and that allows Luchasaurus to the big kick to win. Uh, yeah, this opening match was kind of rough. Like I said, lots of standing and waiting and it just looked really transparent. Uh, lots of confusion on this one, but it looks like the Matt Hardy Guevara angle is getting back on track and that was pretty much, you know, that stuff, and again, Marco being kind of funny in the early part with all the dives and stuff, that was like the lone bright spot for me in this one. John Moxley with a promo backstage, he's got a message for Brian Cage and Ricky Starks who beat up his good friend Darby Allen. He says he doesn't start fights, he finishes them and then Taz, his rebuttal on commentary, says that Moxley is done for, no doubt about it Cole! And then we go to the match I was looking for to all week between both shows, TNT title on the line as Cody defense against 
Warhorse. Ah, I'm so excited for this. Uh, Warhorse, friend of the show, last couple of years has completely reimagined himself and his character on the indie scene and is now one of the most popular names in the indies right now. Uh, he had a huge social media campaign over the last several weeks for Warhorse to come to Dynamite and challenge Cody for the TNT Championship, and it's finally happening, which is just, that blew me away. The fact they finally went ahead and did that and made the match happen. It shows AEW listening to the fans, which you know, you don't hear WWE doing something similar like that. You didn't see some indie name challenge John Cena for the U.S. title challenge a few years ago. And what's great is, too, is the commentary did a really good job kind of building up War Horse's credentials and stuff. Talks about his reign as the independent wrestling champion for IWTV. It's really cool they, they were able to kind of like, you know, bridge that gap between the indies and AEW here. And the storytelling they were doing as well with Cody on Twitter really kind of like underestimating War Horse and saying he couldn't last five minutes with him. I think that was really kind of uh, doing a good job building up more of the hype for that. It's a nice straight up match here and Warhorse really has an answer for a lot of Cody's uh, offense and just really kind of has him on the ropes a couple of times. A lot of big near falls. He like immediately rolls out of a figure four attempt at one point in the match. Uh, Warhorse hits his big elbow drop. We get a real close two count. Cody gets the figure four blocked back in after Warhorse jams his knee and Cody retains but really, I mean, Warhorse losing, uh, you know, whatever. How cool it was to see him get this opportunity in AEW to begin with. I mean, Warhorse looks like a million bucks, and I think it's going to be great for his stock. Uh, Cody looking on the ropes and everything. I think, you know, I've been trying to, I've been noticing more of this and seeing people talk about it more. And, oh, it makes so much sense. Cody is kind of like slowly turning into more of that heel. Like his aggression and his passion the last several weeks have kind of been slowly morphing into a bit of a vicious streak. And I like where they're going with Cody here and what they may possibly be building here. But yeah, again, really cool to see Warhorse get that shot. After the match, though, some Dark Order goons run in and uh, beat up Cody and Warhorse. Out comes Matt Cardona, the former Zack Ryder. He makes a save. He eliminates uh, Silver and Reynolds, and so he's celebrating with Cody at the end. Uh, you know, between the Warhorse match and Cardona showing up, I love this segment. This was just so much hype for me in so many ways. I don't know what Cardona's ceiling is going to be in AEW right now, but I hope that him being there is good for his career. I hope he does well for himself. Tony Schiavone on stage is interrupted by the Inner Circle, who are just hopping mad over their recent misfortunes the last couple of weeks. Uh, Guevara calls Matt Hardy a son of a bitch, or in Spanish, son of la bitch. And Chris Jericho announces in two weeks he'll have a rematch with Orange Cassidy. He also says that next week, not two weeks from now, but next week, he is going to challenge Cassidy to a debate. And there will be a special guest moderator. I'm hoping and praying it's Soul Train Jones. Uh, and then there's more humor with Jericho's jacket. Smells like cat pee now, and Jericho's pissed. You know, even though the 10-man match really sucked, at least the, you know, the inner circle promos always put a smile on my face. We go to a boardroom where FTR finally signed their AEW contract, which, wait, they've been working without a contract in kayfabe this whole time? That, that absolutely blew my mind. Anyway, Arn Anderson shows up as the tag team specialist to help oversee the contract and everything, and then they also mention that there's a clause in their contract where in two weeks, uh, FTR will host a tag team appreciation night. Sounds like it could be very interesting. They sign the contract. Contract, and then Hangman Page shows up with the whiskey and Hangman, he's drinking a lot of that whiskey. Speaking of tag teams, the AEW tag titles are on the line as Hangman Page and Kenny Omega defend against Evil Uno and Stu Grayson of the Dark Order. Veteran color commentator Colt Cabana has joined the table for this matchup here and uh, Anna Jay, new member of the Dark Order as well, is standing behind him next to Brody Lee and everything. I love Colt here where he's like, Brody Lee's a great guy, he's a great leader and a motivator and everything. He buys me meals, but as far as whether he's joined the Dark Order, it's like, I'm just checking things out right now. He's like not very committed to it still. Uh, it's a pretty good match. Dark Order looking good here. I can't help but feel that like watching this match that this is where they wanted the Dark Order to be way earlier, like sooner, like it was shortly after like the when Dynamite got on the air. I get the feeling they were trying to push them, but it was too too much, too soon, and it just like the fans like didn't it didn't click with the fans what they were doing. So they had this kind of hard reset and kind of like changing things and you know bringing in Brody Lee is kind of a slow way to rebuild that. But I get the feeling the Dark Order was supposed to be a lot more important uh, sooner than it ended up getting. In the end, Evil Uno's hit with the uh, V trigger buckshot combo for the champions to retain. Uh, Brody Lee shoes Colt Cabana and Anna Jay away and so then he can be angry at Evil Uno and Stu and everything and so then 
He tells the elite to come out. The Young Bucks, who are in the crowd, by the way, they show up to join the champions and everything. Uh, and Brody says the Dark Order has strength in numbers, and sure enough, a whole bunch of goons surround the ring. But in come FTR to make the save, and so they clear out and everything. So now we have this uneasy alliance, and now we find out you know the plot with the elite and FTR thickens. And next week it's going to be a 12-man tag team match. It's going to be the elite and FTR versus the Dark Order and Colt Cabana. That, I mean, oh God, we just saw a 10-man match and I hated it. I can't imagine what kind of cluster this 12-man thing is going to be. Britt Baker's got something to say about Big Swole. She says that Swole can have a match with her in the future if Swole's able to beat an opponent of Britt's choosing. My money is on like Rebel or Tony Schiavone or something. Speaking of the ladies, our next match sees Diamante versus Karushita in a non-title matchup. They're building up Diamante as, you know, this veteran looking for a shot, looking for an opportunity and a contract with a company. She had a big win over Ivelisse last week and a match on Dark the night before. It's a pretty good match. A couple hiccups here and there. It's like a roll pretend that kind of falls into the ropes at one point. Sheeta wins with a big running knee strike. Good couple of weeks for Diamante here. Even in defeat, she looks pretty good here in this very competitive matchup. I look forward to seeing more of what she has to offer. I have not seen much of her stuff before this, if at all. But I enjoy what I'm seeing here. Like, you know, the women's division needs, it feels like it's losing a bit of momentum at the moment. I'm curious to know how the women's tag team tournament shakes things up, but I think adding some new blood blood while this goes on can't hurt. And speaking of the women's tag tournament, we see Nyla Rose with Vicky Guerrero backstage picking her colored chip to determine, you know, who she'll be paired up with in the tag tournament. And she finds out her tag team partner, it's Ariane Andrew, who's the former Cameron of WWE. They did a really bad job kind of introducing who this woman is, but I think it's cool that they, she's back here. I know she was kind of doing, she was planning on doing like an in-ring comeback uh, WrestleMania weekend for Effie's Big Gay Brunch, but I didn't know, you know, if she was going to keep going with it, but it's good to see her here. It's like, you know, again, new blood can't hurt. And, and, you know, Cameron has been just so far removed from the wrestling public eye for so long. It doesn't feel like, oh, it's a former WWE name, just, you know, whatever, just jumping ship. You know, she had some downtime. She had a hiatus. So yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see what she can bring now that she's back. It's time for MJF's State of Wrestling Address. He's doing this whole pseudo political campaign thing. In the same time that like Jericho is challenging Orange Cassidy to a debate, I don't think you can have two heels doing concurrent politically themed storylines. That seems kind of weird. Anyway, uh, MJF's got a whole staff with him. He's doing this big speech about how he's his agent for change. And AEW has become a dictatorship under the thumb of the champion, John Moxley. It's weird because he's like, he's targeting like the people in charge, but he's not talking about Cody or Kenny Omega or the Young Bucks. He's like the champion. It's not the same thing though, but he basically uh, in this big speech, which is a very good job with, by the way, for the most part, I'll get to that in a minute. He challenges Moxley to a title match at All Out in September, which, you know, if that happens, I'm looking forward to it. I think they've done a really good job building MJF up as this kind of like entitled, undefeated guy. The one knock I had in this promo, though, was the fact that he kind of brought up, you know, the ratings, this, you know, he did for a little bit. Doesn't harp on it too much, but they did kind of stick in my craw for a bit because I feel like AEW is getting that point now where they just keep bringing up the ratings. And even if they're winning in the numbers or whatever, it still just reeks of like desperation and projection to me to keep talking about that. It only, the ratings only matter to such a small fraction of wrestling fans. And to everyone else, I don't think people could really give a shit about it. So the fact that they're kind of harping on that, it does seem like, okay, take your victory lap, but at this point, enough time has passed, you can act like you've been there before. Main event time, it's a no DQ tornado tag match as Brian Cage and Ricky Starks take on John Moxley and Darby Allen, who is conspicuous in his absence, does not come out for his entrance. Before Cage and Starks come out, we go to the back and we see Taz hyping up his men. Ricky Starks cutting a promo saying that Darby wrestles, he looks like Pigpen and wrestles like a crash test dummy. They make their way out for their entrance and Darby dives onto them from top of the set and Taz going, they trapped us, Cole! The match I thought was okay. I didn't think it was like, spectacular. To me, like, the biggest spot was at the very end when Darby grabs like the skateboard with the tacks on the bottom of it and just jams it right into the back of Starks. Like Two weeks in a row, you have big thumbtack spots here. At least you waited until the, uh, the main event to have it this week. And so then Darby pins Starks to win. We get like a stare down between Moxley and Allen. And then there's uh, you know the man on the scene, uh, Tony Khan, to uh, address Tony Schiavone, who then says that next week those two are going to be facing off for the championship. Uh, should be very interesting. These guys have fought in the past, but they were on very different like paths at the time. It was months ago, so now a lot has changed. Should be a wild one. And I thought, yeah, that was a pretty solid way to end the show. 
Time now for me to decide which show won for the week. NXT or AEW Dynamite, and this week it's going to be AEW. And quite honestly, I was leaning toward them anyway when I first heard that Cody vs. Warhorse was, was signed because I was just so jazzed for that. Congratulations to Warhorse for a great opportunity and the amount of work that he put into it to make it all happen. Uh, you'll love to see stories like that. And again, really shows that AEW listens to its fans. We saw two debuts besides him, one noticeably bigger than the other. I think Cardona's a bigger headline, but it's still cool to see the former Cameron back on TV. It's been a while since we've seen her, so I'm looking forward to seeing what she can bring. MJF brought a great promo, and minus the whole ratings talk, I thought the tag title match was great as well. I do appreciate about NXT, like I mentioned. I appreciate that they're taking this route of like the guys who are the more up-and-comers, the dark horses, winning these triple threat matches right now. I've been, they've been throwing some curveballs, for sure. I mean, it's like these guys who are against these much bigger names who you expect to kind of be in that scene, but they're given the spotlight right now to some guys who probably need more elevation. So I'm all in favor of that. But let me know what you thought about AEW and NXT this week in the comments section below. And hey, if this was your first time seeing what War Horse was all about, let me know what you thought about him in the comments section below. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.